So we are waiting for the uh, principal to join, and as soon as okay. you join, we can begin. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Um, shall I put the link now to the presentation, and or shall I wait uh, for everyone to join in? Uh, link uh, as in, uh, as in, as in, uh, you know, when you're presenting something, sometimes people miss something and they want to go back. So I've uploaded it, and anybody on their mobile phone, uh, if they have a second device, they can follow uh, the slides. Okay. Okay. Oh, yeah. Lovely. Lovely. You could do that. Excellent. Yeah. You know, this is a new thing for me. I'm not aware of this. So that's a learning. Uh, yeah. So I run, uh, you know, so I run uh, basically, I use a software so that it produces HTML slides. And so, you know, anybody on the phone or anything can use it. It's, it's quite easy to uh, okay. look at. Interesting. Yeah, so. so the link is up there. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Wonderful. So you've put it in the chat box. Yeah, I put it. I put it in the chat box. Okay. Okay. Wonderful. And Ativa Puri acknowledged it. Okay. <laughs> so it's not. It's not a. I was just thinking. You know, the lecture slot that is the worst. The graveyard lecture slot is the one which is just before the bell when the day finishes. <laughs> and I guess I stand between <laughs> people getting back to, to their homes and uh, yeah. Yes, but that is the time I think they have learned the most. I mean, <laughs> okay. you know, good afternoon, ma'am. 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 So good to see you uh, in spite of such a busy schedule. Today. Um, Thank you so much. It's really <laughs> very encouraging for us. <laughs> yes. I think we can start now. Yeah, you can start now. Please, please go ahead. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, okay. So let me just. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Aniket, uh, uh, we, we have a student compare who's going to begin. Okay. Okay. Yes. Well, very good afternoon to everyone. On behalf of the psychology department of the Mata Sundi College for Women and the Internal Quality Assurance Cell, I welcome you all to the valedictory ceremony of the National Seminar on the Relevance <coughs> of Psychological and Interdisciplinary Practices for Societal and Global Challenges. In the words of Dr. Edward B. Bono, an idea that is developed and put into action is more important than an idea that only exists as an idea. With more than 50 participants coming forward to present their research from the length and breadth of the country, I trace the success of academia. With no further ado, I would like to commence the valedictory ceremony. Now, I would like to hand over the mic to our program's convener, Dr. Garima Kumar, to take the session forward. Over to you, ma'am. Ma'am, you are on mute. Rima, am I audible now? Thank yes, you, Sam. Thank you, thank you, Tanya. Thanks a lot. Uh, it's in fact uh, lovely to have uh, uh, Dr. Aniket with us today, and it's my proud privilege to invite our head of the institution, Professor Hadpreet Kaur, who's been ever so inspiring and encouraging all the way through this journey. And um, you know, she's been the one in, uh, instrumental in making it happen. And let me tell you, our head of the institution is comfortable with donning multiple hats and juggling with multiple responsibilities with utmost ease, be it NAC, be it IQAC commitments. Uh, in the midst of the busy schedule that the institution is going through, when I remember when I uh, and Pooja first approached. Second, uh, when I and Pooja first approached her and brought up this whole idea that we want to go in for a national paper presentation competition with a little bit of skepticism that there are too many things going on in college, she said, go right ahead, you have all my support, and uh, which is really, really very encouraging. And uh, <clears throat> because uh, she says it's, it's for the budding researchers and uh, you know to kind of encourage these research sensibilities while people are still young is very, very, very important. So go right ahead. So the green signal we got, the support that we got, the anchorage that we got, I think it's all because of you, ma'am, that this has happened. And uh, <clears throat> so 
you know, so so it's very uh, gratifying. And uh, as uh, Tane has just appraised, we've, uh, you know, received more than 50 entries. And uh, from all over the country, be it the North, be it, of course, Delhi University and SR and, uh, you know, the Northern states to Kerala, Karnataka, you have paper entries from <coughs> Coimbatore and then the <coughs> Central India, Chhattisgarh. So it's uh, really, really very nice. And in fact, the kind of comments, you know, I've been looking at papers from the undergraduate level and postgraduate levels, the sessions that, uh, you know, one has been attending. Uh, even when people are young, I mean, the kind of rigor that they follow in research, it's uh, very, very heartening. And, uh, you know, the comments that one got was uh, that uh, very, uh, uh, you know, they said that, uh, is it possible that we have it as an annual feature, right, every year? And I think if we have MAM's encouragement, we'll go right ahead uh, next year onwards. Uh, so, uh, MAM, with these words, I invite you to welcome our speaker for today, Dr. Aniket. Yes, thank uh, over you. to you, Dr. Harpeet. Yeah. Thank you, MAM. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, thank you, Garima. And at the beginning of this validity session, first of all, I really want to have a word of appreciation for uh, Dr. Pooja Raghi and Dr. Karima Kumar, who have put in a lot of effort to uh, make this happen. And uh, also the entire team of hers, uh, that they, they have worked uh, quite a lot. And also I welcome uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Aniket. Uh, he is here, he spared his time. I'm so thankful to you that you have joined us. And uh, I'm sure students will learn quite a lot <laughs> from you. And, uh, and this uh, particular program was very special because uh, at the college level also, we have been trying to inculcate this spirit of research into students, because I believe that uh, uh, research is one that nurtures the potential of the youth. And uh, you, uh, one is able to only, you know, achieve the goals until unless, you know, do, you do some kind of uh, effort to make some, some research because um, everything is based on uh, research, especially the market today is based on research all uh, and everything is so data driven nowadays that uh, um, from this data, you can really derive some qualitative and quantitative research also. And uh, so it is important that uh, this spirit of research is inculcated. And I'm so happy to find out that we had very inclusive participation and fr from across uh, colleges in India and universities in India. And also uh, that uh, various levels, uh, undergraduate level, masters, PhD and MPhil scholars participated in this particular uh, event. And uh, of course, uh, Garima's um, suggestion that this we can make it as an yearly feature. Yes, it is quite welcome uh, because uh, it is important that again, once I again I uh, emphasize that it is important that we increase awareness about research right at the undergraduate level uh, because this will develop kind of a confidence in them. Uh, they'll be able to write things, analyze, and also share and disseminate the valuable information. So uh, sometimes at the ground level, realities are something uh, different and the theory suggests something different. So this gap between theory and praxis uh, will also come out only when we uh, do some kind of a ground level research. And uh, also that mental faculties of the students would really be enriched if we continue with this kind of a research program. And uh, so all the students who have participated, uh, I'm sure you have learned quite a lot uh, while doing this, uh, while making your paper, while working for your paper, a kind of a systematic approach towards life and kind of, uh, you know, putting in a lot of effort. Um, that is also important and you have uh, really slogged for it and you have uh, produced something which is tangible, which is um, visible before us. Uh, so I really uh, congratulate all the participants um, and winning is not so important. Of course, uh, winners will be applauded and uh, we will have a kind of a, a kind of a acknowledgement of those who have really done um, quite quite a go good job. Uh, but anyway, all those who have participated 
should have learned in this process. And that was precisely our aim that uh, with such sessions, we give a chance uh, to the students uh, that um, they learn this basic uh, kind of a uh, thinking uh, aptitude and um, all this is developed. And uh, once they start uh, research at this level, I think they can do wonders. And uh, this is precisely our aim. So I congratulate all who have um, participated in it. And also, uh, I really uh, implore that uh, you should continue with this kind of uh, exercise uh, always. And, and because there are a lot of forums where you can present your research and plenty of uh, seminars and uh, conferences uh, which are going on. Uh, but you will have to find your way. You will have to uh, navigate through all these and find where exactly uh, you want to present. And also, there are a lot of research forums also. And, and also, of course, journals are there where you can uh, document your research um, but this is a kind of a learning experience so continue with this habit it is just not the ending let this be just the beginning begin with this and uh, then you know, sky is the limit for you so um, so the, here again once again I will thank my team and all students who have participated and also uh, guest for today um, Mr. Aniket um, I welcome you again and thank you very much Heartfelt gratitude to Madam Principal for your inspiring words. Thank you, ma'am. I would now request our program convener, Dr. Pooja Jaggi, to please take over and say a few words. I hand over the mic to you, ma'am. Thank you, Simran. Thank you, Madam Principal. Uh, it's really heartening, a moment of gratitude and a moment of great pleasure and pride uh, to introduce uh, today's speaker an erudite uh, researcher and a scholar of great repute, uh, Dr. Kumar Aniket. And um, he's currently a research fellow in economics and finance, the Bartlett University College London uh, since 2017. And uh, this is a position where he's exclusively into research. So he's an ideal speaker for the valedictory today and to announce the prize winners. He's held many uh, uh, prestigious past positions, uh, Great Hill Book Fellow in Economics, Lecturer and Director of Studies in Economics, Murray Edwards College, University of Cambridge, uh, which is again a, a university of world repute, Lecturer and Director of Studies in Economics, uh, Newham College, University of Cambridge, Trinity College, University of Cambridge, and uh, lecturer for development economics, economics department, London School of Economics. I mean, uh, in UK, you know, all the best institutions, I think, Aniket have had uh, been fortunate to have you. And uh, he's a PhD in economics from London School of Economics, MA Economics, BA Honours in Economics from Hindu College, and uh, MA from, of course, uh, Delhi School of Economics. His research interests include education and skills, automation, trade theory, economic growth and economic development. And teaching areas are applied microeconomics, macroeconomics, economic development, mathematics, statistics, and econometrics. He has many uh, programming skills as well. He has uh, a number of research papers in reputed journals, the research grants, invited lectures, conference presentation. You know, this goes on and on, uh, seminar presentations. And um, on honors and scholarship, economics department, teaching prize, LSE 2003, LSE research uh, studentship, LSE 2001, and so many other things, Aniket. We are really, really proud to have you. And uh, without uh, taking much of uh, everyone's time, uh, I hand over uh, the proceedings to you. You know, after uh, you are done, uh, you're supposed to announce the winner. So we'll be sharing the list shortly with you. So over to you, Aniki. Um, so thank you very much. Um, um, can you hear me properly? Yeah. Yes, you're very well. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you very much. It's, uh, it's a great pleasure to be here. And uh, it's a college that I have been coming to since I was a teenager. I would come and drop my mother off and pick her up. And uh, it's, uh, it's a set of colleagues that my mother, it, you know, she's always felt like family. So it's absolutely an honor to be invited. And, uh, you know, 
And the only thing is when you speak at your parents' institution, you're just hoping that you stand up, <laughs> you know, you are able to come up to the standard. Um, so um, I would like to thank the principal, Professor Harpeet Kaur, uh, uh, the teacher in charge, uh, Dr. Parinta Gore, uh, the coordinator IQAC, Dr. Lokesh Gupta, um, the convener, uh, Dr. Karima Kumar, and the convener, Dr. Pooja Jackie. Thank you very much for inviting me. And uh, okay, so I'll start. Um, let me share my slides. Share. Right. So when I was asked to speak at this conference, uh, the dilemma I had was that, uh, well, I know very little about psychology. Um, I know about economics, but I know very little about uh, psychology. I'm also very interested in technology, philosophy, uh, other areas. And I thought um, I would use this session as that of try to map out bridges. Uh, so bridges, uh, so we as academics, we often work within silos um, and you know, if you're an economist, you always have a bit of uh, existential crisis because you never know whether economics is a force for good or force for bad. And so I have in the last five years sought to try to understand what we are missing in economics. And in the process, I have educated myself or tried to educate myself to understand what the linkages between these various silos are. And what I'm gonna paint is a bridge Ask some really fundamental question, use some parables, some stories to illustrate them. I also have references, um, but you'd have to be patient because you might think somewhere in the middle of the presentation that I'm telling you too many stories. I'll bring all the stories together right at the end. And um, as researchers who are interested in psychology and other related disciplines, I think India has wealth of data um, which can be exposed to ask some really fundamental question. Um, and what I'm gonna to try to set up today are some fundamental questions that I think have not been explored. They have not been explored because of boundaries of language and they have not been explored because of the silo nature within with academic publishing works, okay? So before I start off with the ideas, I'm gonna start off with a small thing that happens to me almost every second day. And you know, this is just not a story. I hope I can explain what the relevance of this is as the talk progresses. So when I go for a walk, or at least when we could go for a walk um, before I fractured my leg, um, I'd often see this small dog every day or every second day, whenever I come across them, accosting this rather large dog and biting, you know, you know barking its head off. And something about this, was funny, but something was also about this kind of made me wonder, what is it about this small dog um, that it feels that it can challenge the big dog, whereas the big dog just sits there looking very curiously at the small dog. And so then I started thinking about it. Does this dog really know its size? <laughs> you know, does it, it obviously doesn't look at a mirror and presumably it imagines itself to be a much larger dog. And so, and, and this is the existential question, who do, we, who, who do we think we are? And you know, you know, you're all of psychology, you know more about psychology, but I presume this is the existential question um, for all of us, how do we know who we are? And you know, you can imagine that this small dog keeps barking its head off and imagines itself as a more powerful character. Now, keep this example, because I'm gonna tell you something give you another example and this is a bit more terrifying so I'm going to ask you to see a video and I hope you can see this video so this is a video of the Millennium Bridge so the Millennium Bridge was a bridge uh, that spanned the kind of uh, the north and the south bank of London and it was built at the turn of the century and the idea was that the Millennium Bridge is going to not just be a bridge between the north and the south of London uh, it was also going to bridge the two centuries. So, you know, the kind of 
two millenniums. So you know the millennium that we're starting and the one before. So in the past, we would have bridges, which would be built over rivers, wooden bridges, and that would sway. And now we are moving towards bridges that are being built, uh, not by pen and paper, but on computer models. So, you know, it's extremely kind of, if you're interested in architecture, the kind of stuff Frank Gehry makes, you know, everything is modeled on the computer. So they decided they're gonna build a bridge, very futuristic bridge, um, which is going to sway when you walk. So even though it's very futuristic, made out of steel and glass, when you walk in it, it will move a little bit and it'll give a sense that you're walking on a wooden bridge. So now what happens next, I want you to see. So this is what happened on around the first week of January in 2000, when a lot of people decided that they want to go and visit the Millennium Bridge and walk on it and see what the experience is like. So let me, I hope this works. So what happens is, as you can see, that people start walking and the bridge starts shaking, but it starts shaking at a dangerous, with a dangerous frequency, it goes out of control. And so for the designer of the bridge, um, you know, there was obviously a big worry. So it turns out, and you know, there is a, there is a set of papers on it. There's an academic literature in engineering. There isn't an ac academic literature in, so, uh, in social sciences on this. Um, you know, I'm hoping to fill that gap, but there is an academic literature in uh, architecture, which basically said the explanation was as follows. So if you step on a ship or a boat, if the boat moves, your natural reaction is to step in the other direction. And so when you step on the bridge as an individual, the bridge moves and you step, take a lateral step and you move in the other direction to balance yourself. Uh, and then when the bridge moves again, you step in the other direction. So if you have everyone on the bridge, which is about a thousand people, as you can see, they are all stepping away from the bridge at the same time. What they are doing is they are increasing the amplitude or the frequency and amplitude of the bridge moving, right? So you can imagine that the bridge is coordinating everyone's step, a thousand people with all their weight moving in one direction, and then the bridge moves in the other direction, they move in the other direction. And so the, the modelers were very confused because when they had run simulations, this, what, this was not happening. So it turns out there's something really interesting happening here which doesn't happen with a normal old bridge. So this is what a normal old bridge looks like. You know, imagine you are in a precarious mountain, you're walking down the bridge and there are some young, young people ahead of you and they start doing something funny. Now, what would your reaction would be? What would your reaction be? Your reaction would be self-preservation, but your reaction would also be to counteract the movement they're making. Right, so you like to think if they move on the left, you try to move on the right. So you're counteracting. You will never increase the frequency with which the bridge moves dangerously, right? So the question is, what's the difference between the Millennium Bridge and the Rope Bridge? So it turns out, if you think about it, in the Millennium Bridge, you are reacting to the bridge you don't understand what's happening. You don't understand all these people, what they're doing. You don't understand the model of the bridge. You're just reacting and you're reacting in a way which is, which is self-destructive. Whereas a rope bridge is really simple to understand. It's just a really simple thing to understand. You understand how the rope bridge moves. And so you are able to move to a cooperative environment in a rope bridge because you understand how it works. Whereas in the Millennium Bridge, because you become an individual who's reacting to that environment, uh, you're kind of confused. And the reason I you want to use this parable is because I think we are all roaming around in the world extremely confused with the world that surrounds us, uh, which is accelerating technology, with you know kind of environment. So I'll speak more about that. Now you know here's the literature and. This has happened before, by the way. So uh, this has happened in Clifton Suspension Bridge. Uh, there is a 2005 paper which looks at the Millennium Bridge. 
Having said that, it's actually a well-known fact with the computer modelers had not looked at. So in 1831, um, in 1831, um, a brigade of soldiers were marching across England's Broughton Suspension Bridge and the bridge broke and you know, men were thrown in the river. So since then, armies always have had rules and you know, this is armies across the world that when you cross the bridge, you always have to break your steps. So you can imagine a bunch of, you know, kind of soldiers, they march and they march like, they're, like their life depends on them. They get the hit the ground, they, they hit the boot on the ground with phenomenal force. But when you are supposed to march across the bridge, you're supposed to break your step. You're supposed to step in a random fashion. Now, the interesting thing here is that because the bridge is a particular space, which has its own complexity, the soldiers are taught a rule that is congruent with that space. So every space that we are in, we are taught these rules that are congruent because if we, are, we don't follow the congruent rule, the space would not work. Okay. So I wanna talk about what happens with complicated spaces and what kind of congruent rules that we come up with. And you know, once we start talking about that, that's when kind of psychology and kind of collective behavior would come in. So incidentally, uh, so these are the set of references that I have uh, you know, kind of mentioned and there is, you, know, you can follow this and you can find more references on this. So it turns out this idea of what is complex space and what does the person need to know, needs to know to use that space has been thought very thought about quite a lot in various different disciplines. All disciplines call them different things. Sometimes they're called mental model, but I kind of quite like Norman's Norman 1998. And what they were trying to, Norman was trying to say is that when you design an app, when you design any kind of, uh, when you write any kind of computer program, you have to think of the conceptual model that the user needs to know. So, you know, if you use a car, you don't need to know how the engines, you don't need to know how the engine works. All you need to know is that if you push your accelerator or your clutch or your gear, what happens? And if you remember the early days of computer, I mean, the screens used to be black. You need to know, used to know, you, you needed to know programming and, you know, all the complications was given to the, to the users. As we moved along, um, computer programs are, computer programmers are, started using more and more idea of conceptual models. What is the minimum amount that the person who uses this, that kind of object, whether it's computer program or any kind of space needs to know? And uh, if you follow technology, uh, uh, you know, um, Apple had somebody called Jonathan Ive, um, and he was quite instrumental in simplifying the Apple's operating system. And, you know, 10 years ago, his influence in Apple stopped. And once his influence in Apple stopped, um, Apple started getting more and more complicated to use. That simplicity, it still retains some amount of simplicity, but simplicity went away. Now, the idea I'm trying to get at is that you have an environment, and we'll call that space, and I'm going to expand the definition of space, but you have an environment, and you have a set of rules that are congruent with that environment, and if you don't use the congruent set of rules, then the outcome would be not ideal, right? So people instinctively know the conceptual model of a rope bridge, but they do not know the model of a millennium footbridge. People instinctively know the conceptual model of a dictionary, but they may not understand um, what, the, what, the, you know, what the model of looking for some information on the internet might be. I mean, young people do, uh, but older people, so, you know, older people may not know. Uh, so keep that in mind. Okay, so what is space? So what I want to do now is kind of think about where does our understanding of space come from, comes from? So there has been a bit of a colonization of the idea of space from the tradition that follows Descartes, right? So we have the Cartesian coordinate system and you know everyone learns in school that you have X, Y, and Z in three dimension and that's your space. And science has used the Cartesian system 
and they don't have to worry about it because you can design or you can understand how an electron moves uh, or you can understand how an object moves in space in that Descartesian space, a three-dimensional space, which is empty because you know the space is what it is. It's a three-dimensional space. You look at it, it's empty. If you throw a ball, it'll move in a particular, particular way. And the signs thought of space as Descartian and then the social sciences have various traditions, but the part of the social science that wants to be close to um, close to um, science adopted that Descartian space. And those, then they started saying, look, if you have space which is three dimensional and you want to put some human element into it, you can just create another dimension, right? So you can create n number of additional dim uh, dimensions. And so this kind of creates a bit of a issue for us here because is Cartesian space the right kind of space to map human experiential space? And you know, I'll talk more about this, but the human experiential space is far, far more complicated. Uh, and if we reduce the human experiential space to the Cartesian space, the question is, are we getting the right set of intuitions or are we getting some, are we missing out something really important, right? So if you want to build a road, you have to understand that you're changing history. Society will never be the same again after you build the road, right? So if you build a road or you build a particular school, the society will react to that. People will move there. The patterns will change. The number of changes that will occur are difficult to understand and anticipate. And they're only difficult to understand and anticipate because we haven't moved properly towards understanding them. But if we don't understand them, if we don't understand them, the question is, should we interfere with the space? Should we be cautious? You know, should we be, you know, a child is always taught, be cautious when you see something hot or when you see electricity. So should we be cautious about interfering with the space or should we be kind of, you know, a bit cavalier? Now, you know, I grew up in Delhi and the Delhi I grew up in, I used to live right next to All India, All India Institute of Medical Science. And, you know, when I was a young kid, very enthusiastic about cricket, I used to go and play right next to, you know, what is now a big spaghetti junction, big kind of uh, a set of flyovers, I used to play there. And, you know, what I remember clearly is on a Saturday or Sunday, you could actually play on the main road. There was hardly any traffic. And now, of course, the whole thing has got more complicated. Now, all the Institute of Medical Science is better designed as a space, but the amount of construction that has happened in the last 20 or 30 years, Delhi space has evolved in more and more complicated ways. And the question is, are we building space with forth forethought, understanding how relationships would change, or are we building space whenever it's convenient? So for instance, are we building space and thinking about how it will impact crime? Are we building space and thinking about how it will impact social capital? Are we building space and thinking about how it will impact you know, pre-existing social structures? And okay, so I'll pull back and the two things which I want to embed in space is social relationships and power relationships. Okay, so I'm gonna use parables, um, again, examples. So, I'm very influenced. I mean, all this goes back uh, to reading the work of Henry Leferb. So he is um, he's somebody who worked in France. Most of his work is in French. Um, he's part of the French cultural theory, philosopher, and fascinating. He wrote a lot of books, but his 1974 book, which is called Production of Space, is absolutely a fascinating read. And the reason why it hasn't made an impact is because one is in French. And the second thing is that it's very, very abstract. But if you read that book, he's able to tell you what your society today looks like in 1974. He's able to predict a lot of things in that book 
that we are experiencing today. And we are thinking, oh, these are new phenomena, but Henry Le Phelps' 1974 book is absolutely fascinating. And so his main claim, and this is eye-catching and a little complicated, but I've put that down in a box. He claims um, that humans produce space, right? So the Cartesian perspective or the scientific perspective from the sciences has been that space is, exists. It is an empty space, right? So, sorry, can I go back to, so, you know, the Cartesian space is an empty space. It's empty three-dimensional space. It's a physical space that can be occupied by animate and inanimate objects. But the question is, what happens when you occupy that space? Do you change it? If it sounds a bit more abstract, if it sounds a bit abstract, don't worry, I'm gonna kind of pin it down. I'm gonna make it more realistic. But you know, we are in the Henry Lefebvre territory and he's a relatively abstract writer. So he says humans produce space and the humans in turns are produced by the space, right? So if you think of culture, if he thinks of social relationships, power structures, the question is, are they, are they independent of space or does the space embed it, right? Um, okay, so, so Henry Lefebvre says, the social, social space is where the kind of physical space and the social space are entangled. So all the social relationships we have, um, they are entangled. And with that space also comes signs, signs of how to navigate that step. Now, so the example of this that I think is striking is that if you walk into any environment, the way a man experiences that space and the way a woman experiences that space is very different. I mean, you know, if you live in a very safe society, that may not be true. But if you live in Delhi, the way a man experiences the space is very different. And, you know, um, you know, as it relates to work for Newnham College and feminism in the 1960s was born, uh, the new wave feminism in the 1960s was born there. And, you know, kind of have spent my 10 years on trying to understand um, what the 1960s feminism movement was and, you know, where it was going. And, you know, coming from Delhi, I've been, always been conscious that if you experience Delhi as a woman, you're experiencing a very different Delhi than if you're experiencing as a man. Now, here's the, here's the illustration of what I think I've been trying to say, which is the physical space is the same, but a man and woman experiences them in a different way. The question is, is that the same space or is that a different space? And, you know, can we, you know, the way a woman experiences a space or a man's space, can we detach that from space or can we, we have to embed that in space? So somebody from one race would experience the space in a very different way and somebody from another race would, uh, race would experience the space in a very different way. And the question is, can we disentangle that from the physical space or are we wrong to disentangle and think these institutions or culture that we're talking about are aspatial. And I would argue that thinking of them as aspatial is missing out a critical element. And I, you know, I'll try to justify that a little more. But here comes in an empirical problem, which is you can't study this empirically. One, one is the complication where we create space and the space creates us back. So there is an endogeneity feedback loop Right, so we are a product of the space and the space creates us. So, you know, my mother taught me some rules about how to behave. And, you know, she got taught that those set of rules, they have shaped me, but now that I'm away from her, I am using that to, you know, hopefully my wife would say, be nicer to her and create a space which is more conducive, right? So there is a feedback loop. Now, the problem is that a lot of this is intangible. And the, you know, I mean, you know, so I, in my training was in mathematics and I applied mathematician, um, you know, Cartesian system is all that I learned in school and at university. So I'm not somebody who is kind of suspicious of, you know, scientific methodology. I, you know, 
This is what I absolutely love. But there's this fundamental question, which is that if we collect a lot of data about things that we can see, are we missing out on the intangibles, right? So how valid is, you know, how valid is that? So should we make an effort? And, you know, the whole history of social sciences has been trying to find ways to collect data about the intangible, right? So at some point, uh, medicine was, you know, kind of did not have scientific data. We've gone further and made an attempt to collect data about the intangibles. And now within economics, there is a lot of an eff effect, uh, effort to collect the data about the intangibles that I'm aware of. And this is true in sociology, has always been true in sociology. And it, I'm sure it's been true in um, psychology, social psychology as well. But you know, it's just, that's something I know less about. But you know, the question I wanna raise is, can we delink the social relationship from space? In some cases that may be true, but in other cases it may not be true. So the delinking means that what we do is not only do we take the physical space and experience the social space, but we also make mental maps, right? So if you walk into a room and you have a set of friends, you will experience the same uh, space in a different way than if you walk in and you run into somebody who's been rude to you in the past, right? And just the way we create physical maps, we create these mental maps of what our social relationships are. They may not be as tangible, but in our heads, they are very, very clear. They are, they are maps. And they are maps which are embedded in space often, which is if you go to this particular space, you know, you'll meet somebody and you have to be more careful because you, know, you don't get along, but you'd go to this space. So like a classroom is fan, a fantastic example. Can you create a classroom class structure, which is a conducive space. And, uh, you know, my mother has always been an inspiration as a teacher. She told me something fascinating years ago. She said, you know, when she's teaching, sometimes the students say, students would say to her, ma'am, I think we are very tired. Can you please sing us a song? <laughs> so she would say, fine, I'll take a five minute break. And thankfully she sang well, and, you know, she'll sing that song. But the question is, how does that change the nature of that space? You know all classrooms tend to have furniture that's pointed towards the teacher. The furniture often doesn't look at each other. So that means just the way the bridge fragments and makes people individual, you have created authority from, the, from, a, from a teacher, which means you may not have encouraged any peer learning because they can't look at each other. It reinforces the authority, but here's the problem, which is, I mean, do we really think that the teachers don't learn from students? Some of the most fascinating questions that have actually been asked are from students. Oh, from students. You, know, you know, so in a sense, you know, so th that space. So we have this mental representation map. Now, I want to go back to something more concrete. This on the left hand side is the London's actual tube map. Mm -hmm. And this on the right hand side is the tube map that was constructed about 100 years ago. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> How am I doing on time? Can somebody tell me? I'm halfway through. You are, you are, you are fine, Aniket. No problem. You please okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. carry on right so, ahead. Okay, thank you. So the left-hand side is the original map, right? And the right-hand side is the map that was created. Now, this fictional map on the right-hand side has become reality. So if you look at the map, you would find that, I don't know if you can see my thing, but uh, you defined that uh, um, Hoban, where can I find it? So Hoban and Covent Garden are two sta 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 stations, which on the right-hand side map are really far apart, but on the left-hand side map are very close. So what they did was they changed the space and they created a layout, which was like a chemistry diagram. And now everyone has a map of London, which is really complicated because the streets are really complicated, but everyone has a map of London and the property prices often move according to the map on the right and not on the left, right? So it has created this representational graph that we have, which was because, you know, so that we can deal with the complexity of the reality has become real. And that's what people think of in London. Nobody thinks of London, central London, as the map on the left. Okay, so 
one of my favorite poets uh, is Nizam Izikal. And, you know, one of the great things about Indian education was that we were taught a lot of things and we were taught Nizam Izikal's poems. And uh, I don't think I would have reached on my own. I would have found him on my own. So now Nizam Izikal has this poem about an Irani restaurant and it's called the Irani Restaurant Instructions. Um, you know, this is reprinted in 1976, but the original poem is from 1972. So if you haven't been to Bombay, uh, Iranis, Iranis came from Iran, I think in the 18th century, and they created these cafes, which are absolutely legendary. They serve Parsi food, but if you talk to Parsis, they would say, no, 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 this is not Parsi, this is Irani, there's slight distinction. So they have these Irani restaurants, which serve great food, and, but they have a set of rules. And so Nizam and Zikil put those rules down. And I wanna use those rules because I want to use this as an example of how rules that you set up in space create the space. So, you know, that physical empty Irani cafe restaurant is nothing unless and until there are some set of rules and there might be some set of rules that would evolve on its own. But in this case, often Irani restaurant owners create these rules. And these rules are fascinating, both from a sociological perspective, psychological perspective, um, you know, and kind of a business perspective. So I'll read out the poem. It says, please do not spit. Do not sit more, pay promptly, time is valuable. Do not write letter without ordering refreshment, without order refreshment. Do not comb your hair, presumably, because hair is spoiling floor. I mean, this is exactly, you know, exactly the poem. Do not make mischief in the cabin. Our waiter is reporting, right? So there is a monitoring mechanism here, right? So it's not just you can, you know, we are setting you a set of rules. We are also monitoring it. All are welcome, whatever cost, right? So these rules go back a few, you know, a few, you know, kind of decades, decades and few, maybe almost centuries. And you know, it's making it very clear, all are welcome, whatever cost. Um, it's a welcome space till you follow the rule. So you know the rules of the space, you, you can be from whatever cost. If you follow the rules, you can use the space. If not satisfied, tell us. Otherwise, tell others, right? So if you're somebody who's a bit shy, tell somebody who'll speak up for you. And I think this is the most fascinating line, which says, God is great. And you know, I kept wondering why the owner is using God here. You know, where does God come from? And it kind of my interpretation is that the owner is seeking authority and saying, I am deriving this authority from God. And, you know, all humans or all infants are insecure about what God thinks about them. And so, you know, it's deriving its authority. So there's a monitoring mechanism, there's a set of rules, and there is authority. Right, so a restaurant as a social space, is it possible to disentangle the rules of the space from the tangible space itself? And so the Lefebvre's perspective is social space is Cartesian space plus social rules. Now this kind of connects, and I'm just gonna show you the tangent, but there's a lot of work on institutions in various dis disciplines. Uh, the most quoted work that I find is from North, Douglas North, and Douglas North says, you know, so we all struggle with the definition of institutions because, you know, you know, we all talk about institutions, but if you ask to define institutions, we all define it in a descriptive way. The question is conceptually, what is institution? And Douglas North says there are rules of the game. And, you know, the other interesting thing is Henry Lefebvre talks about how space needs rules so every space requires rules of the space. And Douglas North talks about rules of the game. And the question is, uh, Douglas North is talking about rules of the game aspatially, and you know, which is more important, whether you know, kind of Henry Lefebvre's perspective is more useful for us or the other way around. Now, there are two kinds of marked institutions that we often think about. One is a set of market institutions, and other is a set of non-market institutions. Right, so what does market institution mean? Market institution means that you can transact with somebody, find a price, bargain, 
And there are lots of non-market institutions where you can't, right? So there's a lovely study um, on Delhi licensing. Right? So how do you get a license in Delhi? And the study basically finds that if you try to bribe the person when you try to get a license, you can bribe them to overlook your ability to drive, but you can't bribe them if you don't have the right documents, right? So if they don't have the right documents, they don't, you know, they are not ready to take a bribe and change that. But if you can't drive, that's fine. That works, right? So in a way, the, the license that we get is a non-market institution, but the market has impinged itself. Now, the interesting thing, the reason I'm bringing this up is because markets often, and I say this conditionally, they dissipate power. Because if the markets function well, not if they function badly, but if they function well, then a seller and a buyer, you know, you can transact with a stranger. You don't need to have a relationship. You don't need to have a power structure, you know, power relationship. Everyone's equal if it works well. And markets often don't work well. I mean, if they work well, economists will all be out of jobs. Uh, so um, if markets work, they dissipate power, right? And so the complication is that when they dissipate power, they create a vacuum because space cannot exist without power often. And so I wanna take my next example and talk about the filtered fish market. And I'm sure this is true for fish markets all around the world. And the reason is because fish is one of those commodities which needs to be bought fresh. Other commodities can be, can be kept over a longer period of time, but the quality of the fish deteriorates and freezing is not the same thing as eating fish fresh. So, Grady in 1995 went and studied the Fulton Fish Market in New York, which is the biggest wholesale market where all the restaurants uh, go and buy their fish. And she studied the transaction of a very specific fish biting. And what she found was that Asian buyers paid 10% less for the same quality of the fish as compared to other buyers, right? So this is fascinating because, you know, she doesn't say this, but, you know, I presume most of the sellers were white themselves. The question is, why are they giving Asian buyers 10% less? So, you know, you walk into a market, the market is not supposed to have any, any kind of, you know, it's supposed to, you know, seller and buyers in a well-functioning market should have, you know, kind of, nobody should have um, power. And, you know, the fish market in New York is big enough so that there is a lot of hustle and bustle. The question is, why are the Asian buyers paying 10% less? Um, then. So she looks further and she finds a couple of really interesting things, which is Asian buyers are socially organized. So they are poorer, but they're socially organized. And if some seller has a problem or creates a problem for them, they can buy caught them. Whereas the white buyers, the rest of the white buyers were not organized. Now, in this situation, you have to ask yourself a simple question, which is, if a bunch of sellers are selling it at a higher price to white buyers, why doesn't a new seller enter and just start selling them at a lower price? And then she says that the problem is that new sellers cannot enter because the mafia controls the parking area around the fish. By controlling the parking area around the fish, the fish market, they control the loading and unloading. So only the six sellers, which have a relationship with the mafia can sell, right? So the fascinating thing is part of the market, everything works if market works, but market creates a vacuum. And that vacuum, power vacuum is always filled up by th three or four different phenomena. And uh, that's the next slide. But the key thing is that here, the way in which the power works is by controlling the space. The mafia controls the space. You cannot understand the functioning of the market and the social relationships between the Asians and why they're getting a lower price unless and until you think in spatial terms and how the market is controlled. So, so rules, where do they come from? And you know, I think this is a relatively exhaustive list and I'm happy to kind of hear from anybody who thinks I've missed out on something, but 
rules can either come from government, so the legislative, executive, and the judicial bodies. It can come from community. It can come from the kind of bad actors like mafia. And it can also come from privately owned firms, right? So in the context of India, this becomes really relevant because we just don't have the fiscal capacity for the government to create its presence across India. So 33% of India is urban. Even in urban areas, the government is very limited, is limited in its presence. Uh, if you want to understand the amount of presence in the, uh, the government has in rural areas, you know, you just have to watch the bug. Uh, you know, it's, it's, it's basically rural areas have hardly any, any kind of um, government governance mechanism. So they are empty areas where either the community comes up or a set of bad actors come up with the rules or privately owned firms come up with the rules. So this has been studied really extensively by a sociologist called Elena Ostrom, who's a fascinating character. And she's a sociologist who went to Nepal and other parts of the developing world and looked at how local communities manage shared natural resources. And she found that they all come up with rules. Uh, and you know, this thing was so fascinating, which she did over her lifetime, that she actually got an economics Nobel Prize in 2009. So what she found was that communities, when they were asked to look after ponds and fishing waters and forests, they used, uh, they came up with agreed and in rules agreed by the community. So a lot of people have adopted this and say communities come up with the rule but they often miss out in the key part of her work, which is her work is confined to communities where the membership is stable, right? So if your membership is stable, the set of people have to live with each other again and again, they can possibly come up with a set of rules. They can be displaced by bad actors, but they can come up with a set of, set of rules. Okay. So now what I wanted to take you to is the automated algorithms and the internet, because that space for now, us has become more real than anything else. So whatever we've talked about, I'm gonna talk about the space that we live in, the social space that we live in through dictated by algorithms. And I'm gonna talk about three specific spaces, Facebook, Amazon, and Wikipedia, and ask where the rules are being made for the space, right? So it's you know, these spaces have become more real uh, for us than the physical space. And the question is, are these spaces alienating us and making us individual like a Millennium Bridge? Or are these spaces like Grove Bridge, which is giving us a sense of how to coordinate and cooperate and create the set of rules that we want to be governed by? So Facebook. The design of social rules on Facebook is entirely in the hands of Facebook. Nobody can interfere, or at least nobody has been able to interfere to now. And if you've come across Frances Hoogan, she became a whistleblower about three or four months ago, and she explicitly, you know, in her whistle, you know, in her in, in her um, in her kind of statement to the Congress, said that Facebook finds that the twitchier the social network, and the word twitchy, twitchy is very important. The more hate, the Twitch is when people are angry, the more hate the social network has, the more people engage with the social network, it increases the advertising revenue. And so Facebook has no qualms about increasing hate or increasing social rules of how your feed works in order to get people to use more because they, they, they get advertisements, right? So the social rules, are they close to Millennium Bridge or the, Fulton fish market, right? And so this is private. We have given, handed over the ability to make social rules to a private company. Now compare that to Wikipedia and Amazon. Now, most people don't think of Wikipedia as a social space or social media, but Wikipedia actually works as a social space. So if you go back to the talk area, you will find that the community decides what's right and what's wrong. And you know, it, you know, I've been involved in some of these discussions and it's just amazing how much work is goes, goes on in kind of making sure that the information that is being put on Wikipedia is accurate. It's just on pages which are 
access less often, sometimes you get inaccurate information. But in pages which are frequently, it's amazing how much volunteers work together to develop. And so it's much closer to the way natural communities develop social rules. And so Wikipedia as a social uh, is an example of a social media as never talked about. Amazon, you know, at least my feeling on this is a bit more mixed because Amazon doesn't like twitchiness because it wants to sell. Amazon likes a relatively space, social space, but you know, you could also argue that Amazon's not, not perfect. Right, so this is the main point that I want to get to, which is Lefebvre claims that people in power impose spaces on the people who live within them, right? So spaces that we live in, the people in power impose rules and create those spaces for us, right? And the power could be within the community or power could be outside the community. It could be a private firm, it could be a mafia. And if the imposed space alienates people, people invent spaces through the acts of resistance to overcome the alienation. So a lot of things that we see in the society is an acts of resistance because we don't like the space that has been created for us. Final thoughts. So the idea is that I was trying to get to is the space and its rules cannot be disentangled. And so the same space can have different sorts of rules, can have different culture, can have a different environment. And, you know, we are constantly building roads and bridges, markets, apps, right? Without trying to understand what it is doing to us to a society. Those data is more intangible. The way I think about space is that it's multidimensional. It's placed to simultaneity, which is you could have two versions of the world. When you decide to build a road in one way or the other way, you have two different versions of the world. And we don't think hard enough about choosing how to make spaces. We don't think hard enough about the conceptual model that the people had dropped from the space. And this is what I think when I drive to Delhi. So if you go to Chitranjan Park, it's a space that is designed more for community. Whereas if you drive to a greater garage, it's straight streets. And you know there are no common spaces. And so why did I want to talk about this? Because one, I think this is important if we want to understand who we are. Uh, the second thing is that there is very little literature on that. And the third thing is that if you're in India, you have phenomenal scope of trying to collect data and trying to understand because the society is changing quite a lot, moving really fast. It's, there is a phenomenal um, potential on kind of taking this forward. It's also a virginal area. It's not an area which is well-treaded. And so I think it's more exciting to work in areas which are out of the thing, that's just my own thing. But I'm hoping that I've asked some questions uh, which will make you think. And that's what I leave you with. Thank you so much, Aniket. It was just mesmerizing, really. And after the question and answer sessions, the well awaited uh, moment for the prize winners, though each one is a winner from our side. And even principal ma'am will also join shortly for that. But before that, if there are any questions, please, please check the chat box, uh, student compares, and please uh, ask the questions. I'm sure you would be having questions. Uh, if anybody wants to unmute and ask a question, is most welcome also. Good evening, Aniket. This is Harinder Hi. here. Hi. 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 So it was, uh, it was a very, um, it was cogent and uh, cognate to psychology. Uh, the entire concept of space and how space creates you and you create space is for me architecturally what, uh, I'm forgetting the name, who said uh, form follows, uh, yeah, form follows function, right? So yeah. this is the in, yeah. So this is the entire 
the entire sociological and psychological concept of space and even the the entire set of relations in any context to me have always been defined by that and power structures not only social structures but as you rightly pointed out power structures are also very clearly uh, discernible from physical form because the entire concept of pulpits of elevated uh, spaces and non elevated spaces and interactions based on physical structures they are they get juxtaposed into social structures right and then psychological issues that emerge from the physical creation of space whether it is mental health issues or um, you know uh, uh, definition of self how i define when you put me in uh, in the court and you make me stand behind the uh, in the witness box or in the uh, you know in the uh, victim box how i will define myself is dependent upon that space that you have created so space as you rightly pointed out uh, is the creation of self is largely contingent upon the perception of space and in social arenas it works all the time but it also works in smaller informal settings like family right so in um, as a student of psychology when we teach community psychology the entire concept of space and its relationship to communities and community usage of space and community definition of space is something that we uh, work with with our students so what you are saying i mean i don't have a question as such but for me it has been very very uh, you know apart from being very very enriching and you know an enriching experience has also been very validating because that is what we are talking about in psychology in community psychology specifically we talk a lot about space so yes what you are saying is it's wonderful and it was wonderful to hear and especially from you because you are not jayshree son you've been a son to, for us all of us you are a son here so it's a pride it's a moment of pride for us to have you here and uh, kudos to jayshree to have raised a son like you so wonderful <laughs> thank you arinder ma'am thank you so much uh, can i just uh, uh, principal ma'am is yeah. also here yeah. and yeah. it's been a pleasure listening to you thank you thank you so if uh, there are no questions uh, then i think i think uh, can i just uh, can i just right? add can, can i just say something yes please um, yes yeah, yeah. so uh, you know so i mean going into this i you know i knew it was uh, kind of talking about something which in other disciplines has been well understood and i think the the thing i think has not been well understood is the relationship of market with those spaces because we believe that markets or at least that's been the belief that markets are going to decentralize spaces and dissipate the power structure and you know if you look at the urban planning in india i mean india's development model is move everyone to the urban cities you know so <laughs> rural areas have almost no planning at all and so the thing that i'm really interested in is the relationship between markets and that space you know and yes. yeah or at least i haven't found anything on that so well, you may not find but what you're saying is valid because there is no perfect market so and an hierarchy will exist everywhere so even in any creation of a market hierarchy will also exist and that will redefine what the market may have originally set out to create that egalitarian structure that a market may have set out to create may will never exist because it will because it will create its own because it will create its own hierarchy and then the entire power play will come in there too so something interesting happened in new york with Rudy Giuliani you know so uh, he came in and this is 1995 and in uh, around the time you know just after the study was done he started taking away the mafia contracts and it's quite fascinating that the suddenly the moment he started undercutting the mafia contracts started prosecuting them the the market at least this small market started functioning you know so you know and in, in a way it's kind of uh, this this idea that if you leave the space in its vacuum power structures would emerge 
and the role of the state, you know, what is the role of the state? You know, if you think about the Kassan movement that, you know, we've, we've all heard of, I mean, this is about those rural spaces where there's one part of the country saying, you know, you know, if, you, if the market works, then everyone would be better off. But the Kassans who were very thought about this very carefully said, no, that's not actually true. That's not actually true. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Thank you, Aniket, thank you. So now uh, we are approaching the well-awaited moment. Principal Ma'am is here to encourage all the prize winners. And uh, Aniket, I have sent the list of winners on the WhatsApp and um, under the guidance uh, and presence of uh, Principal Ma'am, I request you to uh, announce the prizes. I hope you've received it. Yes, uh, let me just uh, kind of put it on my computer. So After that can... each name is announced, uh, please wait because we have a short uh, honoring video, very short honoring video for each uh, winner. But each okay. one is winner, uh, the quality of papers overall has been excellent. I have to say that because I was hopping from session to session. Mm. I was not judging any session, even Garima mm. would, you know, watch that's, for this. Uh, that's what I noticed. Each, I think. each one of you is a winner and please keep coming every year and bring more and more of your friends. Thank In you. some session, it was very difficult to decide. Yes, you most of the sessions, ma'am, yeah. it was the same story. Yeah. Most of the sessions. Yes. yes. So Thank it you. is the quality and the quantity. I think um, we gratified. We really, really very, very happy with your presence. Uh, it was so really, very difficult. Blessings of Mata Sundriji, guidance of our principal <laughs> and our departments and IQSC's corporation. Yes. And most importantly, you know, technical, but even... The most important is my students. Students, yeah. The That's student right. coordinators have worked so hard and they have been so unwell. Four, five of them, two, three have COVID. Garima had COVID. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, one of our speakers had COVID. So it's... it's, it's uh, but we've been able to pull through this. It's only because of the students. It's your enthusiasm, I think, that keeps us going. And even the uh, participants had some of the had fallen sick, yeah. sick. even yeah. Javi <laughs> Kar rahe hamari, uh, uh, Simran. 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 Is also Simran is also down with COVID. So, uh, but Thanks. we've managed and yeah. uh, we've managed because of the kind of resilience they've shown and the kind of Absolutely. enthusiasm. Uh, tremendously commendable. <laughs> Chalo, ab zada time nahi lagayenge. Uh, all beating hearts, but all of you are winners. Yes, Saniket. <laughs> right. So, the first prize is for relevance of psychological and interdisciplinary practice for societal and global challenges. And the first prize goes to yeah, yeah. Um, Avlin the prizes Ford. would be session wise. Uh, the prizes would be session wise, Aniket. Aniket, if you can announce the session first. Okay, sorry. Um, no okay. problem. So, uh, do you, yeah. uh, so the session was positive and clinical psychology session one. Uh, and do you want me to also say more of the presentation or? Uh, uh, no, you can uh, say the name, uh, course, and the university of the winner. Right. The so the title of the, the presentation. The title of the presentation. So the title of the presentation was. Uh, so it's a it's a the first prize goes to Avlin Kaur from Mata Sundari College, and the title of the presentation was Rele Relevance of Psychological and Interdisciplinary Practice for Societal and Global Challenges. Thank you. <laughs> next one, you can announce the next one. Yeah, so the next one is uh, it's uh, for oral presentation. Um, and it's a first prize for the same session that goes to Meren Biju from Christ University. And the title of the paper was Experience of Academic Anxiety Among Higher Secondary Students in the Context of Pandemic. Can you please play? Can please play? Can we play the video, please? ये ये किसका है? Already जो यहाँ पे दिख रहे हैं national paper presentation में ये इन्हीं का है, ma'am. But the teacher is hers. Yes, they need to play the video for it to carry it forward. I think Tanya is doing it. Tanya Hiral, who's managing this? Tanya. 
I, I don't it's, know. There's it's, some it's a shmi or, uh, You know, some uh, some. Yeah, uh, it's it's issue. fine now. Yeah. Uh, the volume is not there. There's a problem in the volume. Uh, no, no, no. She's just trying out, I guess, before. Audio audio is not clear. She's First one was perfect. Right. So the next session is Social and Development Psychology, session one. And the first prize goes to Parneet Kaur from Mata Sundari College. And the title of the paper was Luxury and Identity, Two Sides of the Same Expensive Coin. Um, the second prize for the same session, Social and Development Psychology, goes to Anua, Anuaya, Anuaya Tandon, Banaras Hindu University. Um, the title of the paper is, Is Friendship Closeness Through Social Media the New Normal? Um, so that's, yeah. The next session is, uh, the, the prize for the next session uh, is for positive and clinical psychology session two. Um, the prize, the first prize goes to Snehil Chauhan from Punjab University. The title of the paper was Exploring Gentle Differences in Perceived Stress and Coping Strategy Among College Going Students Amid the COVID-19 Pandemic. Institute, I don't know. Here it is saying Tata Institute of Social Sciences. <laughs> I don't know. That's maybe. Uh, but yeah, what's the correct one? Is it Punjab University or is it Tata Institute of Social Sciences? Tanya? Any? Uh, Aniket, you can proceed. Okay. Um, the. The next prize uh, is the first prize again in uh, the session on positive and clinical psychology. It goes to Ayushi Srivastava, Srivastava Christ University, uh, MN Psychology. The title of the paper was Trust, Happiness, and Emotional Attachment Among Traditional. And the, the last word is miss, I can't read it. Okay, no problem, no yeah. problem. Yeah, sorry. It was online dating. <laughs> <laughs> Trust, happiness, and emotional detachment among online dating and traditional dating, a comparative study. Thank you. Thank you. So the next session is counseling and mental health concerns. Uh, the first prize goes to Devyanshi Sharma, Dolatram College, BA in psychology. Um, the title of the paper is Hope in Times of Pandemic. Pandemic times, yeah, thank you. Uh, the second prize for the session on counseling and mental health concerns goes to Ishata Sharma, uh, University Maharani College, uh, BA Honours in Psychology. The title of the paper is Family Relationship and Empathy During Pandemic. Um, so for the session on social and development psychology, uh, the prize, the first prize goes to Shabdika Datta, Kamla Nehru College, BA Honours in Psychology, and the title of the paper is The Circle of Reality.
Um, the second prize for the session on social and development psychology goes to Anubhav Monga, NIMS University, Rajasthan. Uh, the title, title of the paper is Roboticism, a Dysfunctional Gestalt of Human Nature and Toxic. Defense. And that's where the title stops. Defense mechanism. Defense mechanism. Yeah. yeah. Um, so the next prize is for the session on positive and clinical psychology, session three. Uh, the first prize goes to Sudha R um, from the Avi, Avinash Lingam Institute of Home, Home Science and Higher Education for Women in Kambatur. Uh, she's a PhD research scholar. With um, a picture, picture is different, I think, Amit. So the, uh, the next one has the next one hasn't changed. Yeah. So the please play. Yeah. yeah. So it's a Sudha R and the title. Yeah. Um, so the second prize for positive uh, and clinical First, psychology uh, session. Please play, uh, please play this. Sorry, sorry, Aniket. Yeah. And the title also. Yeah, so the second prize goes to Irene Kosla, IGNU, uh, and the title is Does Religious Commitment Facilitate Forgiveness? A Study on Indian Young Adults. Right. Can you play it, please? So the first prize for applied social psychology, uh, the first prize goes to Ashwarya Sharma from the National Institute of Educational Planning and Administration. She's, uh, the course is integrated MPhil and PhD program. The title is from survival to revival, a class of traditional private tutoring center during COVID-19 pandemic. The second prize for the session on applied social psychology goes to Janani Seka uh, uh, from the Minakshini Academy of Higher Education and Research. Um, she's a PhD scholar and the title of the paper is Influence of Transcendental Meditation on Sclerosis Affected Middle-Aged Men. Was this the last uh, one? Uh, I think so. I mean, that's, yes, uh, this is a applied social psychology, the last one. Okay, okay, thank okay. you. Thank you. Thank you so much, everyone. Uh, uh, many congratulations to the prize winners. Now over to the student compares, please. Thank you so much, sir, uh, for uh, taking out time and making this event even more special. We have learned a lot from you today and hope to apply and take inspiration from you. Thank you once again. I thank all the participants who took part in this event and congratulations to the winners and to the participants. Now I would uh, like to invite our uh, teacher in charge of the psychology department, Dr. Pranita Gaur, to please take over and convey the vote of thanks. Over thank to you. Thank you. Good evening to our esteemed guest, Dr. Kumar Aniket, Dr. Sanjay Kumar, Principal Ma'am, Professor Harpreet Kaur, my colleagues, all the session heads, dear students, and all the participants and judges. It is a great honor to propose the vote of thanks to all who have helped us in making this national seminar such a success. On behalf of the Department of Psychology of Matasudri College for Women, Dr. Sanjay Kumar, Senior Lecturer, 
lecturer and lecturer and assistant director center for psychological research oxford brookes university uk and dr kumar aniket research fellow university college london please accept our gratitude for motivating and inspiring our students dr sanjay shared with us his insightful research on self and emotion recognition which for our students was indeed very thought provoking and intellectually stimulating aniket we all are very emotional to have you have no words to appreciate you i just can share all the messages emotionally emotional uh, related messages i can send you after the session we all are very happy to listen to you here after so many years very well you have explained about the social space about the physical space that how human uh, experience uh, about the human experience spaces about the collective behavior relationship between human and social space mental map and representation all these things i think our students will get some benefit and they will also do some research even about such topics also i heartily thank our principal ma'am professor harpreet kaur for continuous support guidance and insightful suggestions our sincere gratitude to you ma'am for always encouraging us to do the activities thank you dr lokesh kumar gupta iqsc coordinator for your active support as you always do to conduct such programs i would like to thank dr garima kumar and dr pooja jaggi for organizing this wonderful national seminar and giving our students a platform to share their knowledge and researches my heartfelt gratitude to my dear students students coordinators hiral atiwa jagna vidisha tanya simran ishmi bisman kirandeep navleen so many students i can't take the name of all the students who have worked hard day and night and given and gave enormous support to make this program successful really i am very thankful to all the students success of the program is only because of the effort of our students they have done lots of work so really i thank you and i love you all my students a special thanks to mrs sangeeta pathak for the technical support and coordination my thanks is also due to my colleagues and all the participants who participated yesterday and today for this uh, for this uh, in this seminar and once again i thank you all for your cordial cooperation thank you ma'am environmental sciences yeah. colleagues also it's also Yes, yes. All those were uh, the heads. Me, yeah. I sub. Beautiful. They all were guest heads. Dr. Kamlesh Kaur and Judge. Dr. Kamlesh Kaur, Kavita, and Dr. Kavita, Dr. Yes, I appreciate it. And if there is any delay, then for that reason, again, I am saying that because any program organizer can ignore, convener cannot do anything unless we all work in a team. So really, I am thankful to each of you. Even our guest also अगर guest नहीं होते तो हमारे program नहीं हो सकता मैं सबसे पहले principal आती है principal ने अगर guide नहीं करता principal ने okay नहीं किया होता तो शायद हमारा program नहीं हो पाता although she is very much busy nowadays she is very busy but still she has given us time because of that we are able to organize this seminar otherwise अभी तो ये postpone हो जाता है पूजा नहीं हो पाता yes, so, thank you absolutely, thank you ma'am absolutely so, true हाँ you and that is so true yes. ma'am अभी भी इतने थके हुए थे yes. and I know Excuse me, excuse me, she, she was in the inauguration, and again here in this. And she is again here. She is. Yes. 